Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar series with today's webinar on the topic of Growing Pulses on Sands. My name is Claire Brown, and I work with the Birch Cropping Group on the GRDC-funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming system groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability options. Now, before we start the webinar, everybody should be muted. We will take presentations, we will take questions after the presentation and the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. So if you see a button for Q&A, if you click that, you can open the window, type your question into the box and then hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the question. This webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing or if you have any technical issues uh, or would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Michael Moody. Michael is the Managing Director uh, and a Farming Systems Research Agronomist with Frontier Farming Systems based in Mildura. Michael has over 15 years experience delivering research and extension across the Mallee and the wider southern low rainfall farming regions. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Michael Moody. Thanks, Michael. Great, thank you, Claire. And, um, yeah, welcome everyone this morning. So just to set the scene a little bit, um, just wanted to talk about um, the expanding pulses in the in the valley and uh, I guess the, the wider low rainfall area. So here I've got some data um, from a roadside survey um, transect that used to be run by the Department of Agriculture. Um, and we decided to, in 2017, have a uh, redo this survey following the same transect that had previously been done. The survey hadn't been done for um, a good 10 years and um, yeah so we knew there'd been some big changes we wanted to quantify what those changes were. So you can see um, between 2006 and 2017, 2017 being the black bars, uh, on this chart over here um, this huge increase in uh, the amount of of, of the number of paddocks sown to legume and oilseed crops. And basically what's been happening over uh, that decade period, we've seen a big decline in pasture area and especially a big decline in fallow area and um, those uh, paddocks being reallocated um, to legume and oilseed um, crops. So moving from a, around about 7% uh, of paddocks in 2006 to about a quarter of paddocks or 25% in 2017. If we break that data out down by crop, so uh, what did we see in 2017 um, in crop type? Um, we're now seeing lentils um, in particular um, being um, the third largest crop um, in, in the valley behind um, wheat and barley, um, but still considerable areas of things like field peas, vetch and, um, and lupins as well. So I guess that's raising some challenges in that um, pulses are expanding into these low rainfall regions. But one of the one of the issues isn't just low rainfall, but uh, it's actually um, the soil types that um, these pulses are encountering as well. So uh, this is some data from um, a trial site that we ran at Loxton. Uh, we had the same soil type, or the same trial site for for three years. Uh, in this instance. And you can see here that um, what we call our flat soil, which was a, a loamy, red loamy soil, so you know, considered a good soil for growing pulses, compared to a deep sandy soil, uh, which is deep challenging for pulses, there's a huge difference in, in productivity uh, over that three year period. So this is averaged across three years. But you can see um, the difference between the flat and the sand for field peas, 35%, uh, vetch, 18%, lentils, 63% difference in yield, 
between what could be achieved on the flat and what we're seeing on the sand. Lupins, obviously, we know they're better adapted to sand, so the, the difference was much smaller. But then faber bean and also chickpea, only about 50% of the yield being achieved on the sand is what um, we would achieve on the better soil type. And both of these soils uh, were in the same paddock and located only about 200 metres um, apart. So a big change in productivity potential um, over quite a small distance. So some of the things we've been um, looking at in response to that is um, you know, what, what are the agronomic uh, management factors that, uh, that we might be able to look at to, to close this gap between sand and also um, what was achieved on the flat. So one of the common um, issues with growing pulses on the sand is, is managing our Group C pre-emergent herbicides. So um, we ran a trial at Pinaroo this year in uh, South Australian uh, Mallee and we looked at a range of uh, pre-emergent herbicides. Um, we looked at rates uh, and also how we applied them. So whether we applied them as an off before sowing, so as a incorporated by sowing treatment or a post sowing pre-emergent treatment. And here's a, um, some imagery that we took of um, uh, the trial site. This is one treatment, which is the herbicide Diuron. Um, and you can see here, as we go uh, from left to right, we're increasing rates. Um, and uh, within a rate, we've got an IBS versus PSPE. So this picture was taken, or this imagery was taken in the, in the middle of August 2019. And you can see here a big impact um, as we increase the rate uh, on our crop um, from diuron application. Um, but there is some differences between IBS and PSPE. So if you look at uh, what happened on in final grain yield in those treatments, so here on the left, we've got our diuron treatment. Um, so uh, if we increase the rate, obviously there was a rate response um, for this um, treatment. So keeping rates uh, relatively low was important. But importantly, you can see a big response from IBS or PSPE. So commonly, um, this herbicide might be applied in these paddocks at around um, 400 grams per hectare uh, on this type of soil type. So we can make that rate um, quite safe by applying IBS compared to the nil treatment. Uh, but a second, we uh, increase rates or increase or change our um, strategy to PSPE, we're suffering uh, much more damage. Uh, for metribuzin, um, all rates uh, were damaging uh, relative to the nil. Um, interestingly, last year this didn't increase as the rate increased, so um, basically you got damage from applying the metribuzin or not, and that may be due to uh, pretty limited rainfall um, throughout the year. But again, you can see this safety factor between IBS and PSPE. Uh, if you look at simazine now, simazine uh, increased damage as you increase rate, uh, but there wasn't much of a difference whether you applied it on the or PSPE. Um, and turbine, um, similar to uh, diuron in a way that uh, could be uh, much safer um, as we applied um, in an IBS situation, but um, highly, highly damaging to the crop uh, in a PSPE situation. So one thing is to uh, currently is to, to really think about you know maintaining those low rates, um, maybe selecting um, less uh, less risk herbicides uh, over others and, and definitely keeping that IBS system in place. Um, but in the future we'd like to think that there's um, you know, technology that's going to come through in a varietal sense. So this is a bit of a, a demonstration um, that was run by Ag Victoria at um, Oyen um, in 2018. So Mitchell from, who was part of the Regional Research Agronomy Program, um, implemented this trial. And what they had was they either had a current uh, intolerant line, which is um, Jumbo 2, or they implemented a herbicide tolerant. And um, you can see from the pictures here, um, uh, this is a drone shot taking um, throughout the season. Obviously, um, the growth in the 
nil plots, which are right in the center, uh, were quite good. Um, but the second, uh, we move to the right and apply uh, metribuzin either at a high rate or a low rate um, in Jumbo 2. Uh, this is quite damaging, uh, but in the herbicide tolerant one, we can make that safer, um, especially at this low rate. And if we look over the table here, uh, we can see uh, this is biomass at crop maturity. Uh, in the nil, we grew 1.2 uh, tonnes per hectare. Um, if we put a low rate of metribuzin on and uh, as a PSPA application, uh, basically we, we didn't get any, um, any growth from the crop. Uh, but if we have a herbicide tolerant uh, variety, uh, we can still maintain um, some biomass there. So it's just illustrating that um, why the herbicide tolerant lines might be uh, totally, um, totally safe. Um, they're going to improve our safety margin uh, on these sandy soils and, and uh, it'd be good technology to, to come through uh, into the future. So a second line of inquiry we started last year was um, looking at um, deep ripping and also um, soil amelioration more generally. So this trial site was at Coolanong uh, in the Victorian Mallee. And what we had was we had three different small trials, one for lupins, one for lentils, and one for chickpeas. Um, and basically the trials were quite simple. Uh, they were a factorial trial with plus and minus ripping um, or plus and minus organic matter. So the ripping was done to about 500 millimetres depth on about 56 centimetre spacings. And we had a blend of chicken litter compost um, material that was applied on the soil surface at five tonnes per hectare prior to the ripping op operation. So you can see um, for lupins here, um, these two bars here where we're implementing ripping, uh, we can see a, a big difference between uh, the no ripped minus organic matter or the no ripped with organic matter. So basically we're seeing a big response to ripping, um, but no response to organic matter. And the ripping took the, uh, the crop yield at that site for lupins from 1.75 tonnes per hectare uh, up to 2.1 tonnes per hectare. So around about a 20% yield increase. If we move over to the lentils, we saw a big, really big response um, to the ripping. Uh, basically, we took zero, the unripped plots from 0 0.1 tonne per hectare. And if we apply their ripping treatments, uh, we took that yield up to half a tonne per hectare. Um, but again, no uh, response there um, to organic matter. Um, and chickpeas, um, again, a very big response. So 0 0.25 tonne per hectare unripped. Uh, and where we've ripped, 1.2 tonne per hectare. So a very big response uh, in the chickpeas and something that, um, yeah, very excited about. And if you have a look at um, the picture that we took um, at the end of September, um, you can see uh, the difference there with the unripped plots on the left and the ripped plots uh, on the right um, for chickpeas, just sort of confirming the, um, the extra growth, but also uh, the, the amount of pods that are, that are on, setting yield potential on the right hand side compared to the plots on the left hand side. So we had another trial that was um, in collaboration with the uh, SA Murray-Darling Basin uh, NRM board and Mallee Sustainable Farming. So this was at Lamaru last year and it really just does back up uh, the results we saw uh, from uh, the trial work at Coolanong. So uh, our lupins um, had a response of about 22% increased grain yield when we ripped the sand prior to sowing compared to where we didn't. The lentil had a big response, 63%, um, but still um, there's this concern that the, the overall productivity, even under ripping of lentils, uh, is quite low and that compared to the other crops, and that's something to, uh, that we need to follow up some more. Um, if we looked at field pea, a 48% increase and a veg, a 32% increase. And you can see here that the rip plots are uh, doing just as well as the so 
um, that's something that's uh, very encouraging um, as well. Unfortunately, at this site, um, for unknown reasons, uh, we had an establishment issue with the chickpeas. Um, may have been herbicide related, so uh, we don't have data for chickpeas this year. Um, and also, we implemented um, this treatment, which was the vetch canola mix, um, and uh, we had very similar biomass responses to the other crops from ribbing, um, around about that 50%. Um, but unfortunately, we uh, lost a lot of grain in canola um, through bird damage, so we weren't able to um, fully um, see the, the true benefit of that treatment. Also, as part of that trial at La Maru, um, which was on sand, um, we had some treatments, which was plus and minus uh, a nutrition package. So this nutrition package supplied extra NPK, S, zinc, copper, and manganese above what our standard um, treatment was, uh, standard base agronomy. So standard base agronomy was to apply 50 um, kilograms per hectare of granule oxide. Um, so that was our uh, standard treatment and we looked at nutrients above that. And as you can see there, um, the, uh, the benefit of the extra nutrient package above what was supplied through a base fertiliser, um, there, was, there was no benefit there. So um, sticking to the, the base fertiliser and ripping were the benefits uh, in, this, um, in this trial. The nutrition on sand is, is something that we've been um, evaluating over um, a two or three year period now, and we really haven't been able to come up with, um, with too much, too many uh, clear benefits from um, supplying nutrients above what we might do in our um, normal sort of practices. Um, so this trial here was a pot trial where we collected soils from four different locations in the South Australian Mallee, Alawuna, Karunda, Lamaru and Loxton, uh, and we grew chickpeas uh, in these plots, pots and in a glass house and added all those different nutrients in uh, as we went along. So you can see the nil treatment, which is adding no extra nutrients, is um, I've, I've placed a dotted red line. And apart from a few instances of nitrogen um, and a few instances of sulphur and one instance of phosphorus, uh, there's not a, a great deal of extra uh, extra benefit from from the nutrient treatments. Um, perplex, perplexingly, um, we have seen these um, suppressive effects um, of um, uh, trace elements which were um, um, applied in the treatments, um, and that's something that we really don't have a, a good handle on why that may be, uh, but um, we don't think. We think it's related to um, maybe a toxicity in a pot environment rather than what you would experience uh, in the field. And just to follow that up, this is exactly the same um, trial, four soil types from the SA Mallee, uh, but with lentils now, and again, um, very similar results. So our, our conclusion from this pot experiment was that uh, we did see small benefits of energy nitrogen and sulfur in some soils. Um, we saw a suppression of growth with trace elements. Um, but realistically, um, you know, there's no really recommendations um, for additional nutrients above what is your um, best practice. So, um, you know, soil test, if you've got very low nitrogen or very low sulfur levels, then there may be a benefit on those soil types, but there's no general universal rule that those nutrients are, are going to provide your benefit on your given soil type. So using a soil test to diagnose. And then what we're doing in our, um, our base level fertilizer strategies by applying some MAP or DAP, which has a little bit of nitrogen, uh, which uh, has obviously a phosphorus, um, we're not really seeing a benefit of, um, of moving beyond uh, beyond that in a great deal. And again, nutrition on sand, again, um, a trial that um, has been run in conjunction with um, Agricultural Victoria at Oyen, just backing up um, what, we've, uh, what we've seen um, on, on other sites and other projects relating to nutrition. So here we had um, two trial sites, uh, 
only uh, 100 metres apart, one on a flat soil and the other one on a sand dune. Um, and then we grew chickpeas and lentils. Uh, and what we did in this trial is we applied all the nutrients as, a, as an overall package. Um, and then we excluded one nutrient uh, at a time. So we either had the nil, which was no nutrients, uh, we have the all, which is all the nutrients, and then we remove the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, zinc, copper, manganese, and molybdenum, uh, one nutrient at a time. So um, really the only significant effect that we, we have, were able to capture in this trial was for lentils grown on the sand, um, so very low P, uh, yield following removal of P, um, but, you know, the, the new treatment or even all treatment was, was only going 0.2 of a ton per hectare so the trial uh, was a very low yielding trial in that year as well so again um, nothing here to, to suggest uh, other than maintaining uh, best practice which is to soil test understand where nutrient limitations may be um, and or um, you know sticking to those base level fertilizer strategies of, of MAP or DAP uh, Going above and beyond that, there's um, not a whole lot of evidence here to, to say that there's um, going to be a response on these sandy soils. So that's um, that's a quick summary of um, you know some of those topics. Um, where we're heading to here, I think um, focusing more on the deep ripping and soil amelioration approaches. Obviously, um, look to be some low hanging fruit there. Um, there's some operational issues about that in making sure that we uh, we can. Uh, effectively seed into those and establish a crop under um, those modified soil types. But one approach we really, um, you know, would really like to tackle as well is, is thinking about the stacked approach. So what can we do if we, uh, if we find some, uh, maybe you know, be able to deep rip, uh, be able to use varieties that are herbicide tolerant, uh, and also maybe varieties that um, have extra um, capacity to grow on sand soils such as traits such as uh, high omega is some of the work that we'll uh, be concentrating on this year. So, uh, so any questions, I suppose? Thank you very much, Michael. Um, if you'd like to ask Michael a question, please click a button down the bottom of your screen and you can type in a question there. Um, I haven't seen anyone type a question in yet, but I've got uh, one for you, Michael. Just on the, on the deep ripping side of things, that showed some good results there. Is there an optimum sort of depth that you suggest people undertake the deep, deep ripping at to maximise the pulses? Um, we haven't looked at depth in pulses, we've looked in depth in cereal crops. Um, the, the answer to that is that you can diagnose it with a device called a penetrometer. So um, it's really the best way is to, to, to use the penetrometer um, and that will tell you where the restrictive layer is occurring. Now in these sandy soils, we're typically finding that the penetrometer readings are higher, somewhere between 300 millimetres and 500 millimetres. 30 to 50 centimetres. So um, you, you want to be able to find where that um, where that resistance is and you want to be able to target your ripping so that you uh, you uh, make sure that you uh, at least work to that depth or below. Okay, uh, oh, we've just got a question that's just come in, Michael. Um, is it too late to deep grip this year? Uh, no, not at all. Um, yeah, it's uh, we've done all their ripping pretty much just pretty much immediately prior to sowing. Uh, now that's not you know probably achievable on a big farm level, but um, you know one of the important things about deep ripping is to, to try and make sure that you uh, can maintain a a nice seed bed uh, prior to sowing, so you don't want lots of clods and and 
boulders that are going to make that saving operation challenging. So um, waiting until you've, you've got some um, um, good moisture conditions is, is one way to achieve that. And for a lot of places now, they've, they've had some um, decent rainfall that's um, allowed some moisture into that profile. So, but yeah, uh, it's not something that you need to necessarily um, do and then, then wait a period of time. So still plenty of time for deep ripping if, you, if you've got access to a deep ripper. Okay, yep, excellent question there that just came in. Uh, we still got four minutes if anyone wants else want sorry three minutes should I say look if anyone else wants to type another question go for it or is there anything else Michael that you've just thought of that you'd like to make mention of that you didn't earlier no not really I think there's another question there. oh another question here we have yes why should you consider sewing a pulse after ripping compared to a cereal? Are cereals more responsive? Yeah, well, that's um, that's a question that um, is definitely worth considering. I haven't um, got the answer in every situation. Um, no, I wouldn't say cereals are more responsive. In actual fact, you know, our biggest response last year came from uh, what we saw with, um, with the chickpeas. Um, People say one of the downsides, obviously, with lupins or legumes, uh, I should say, is is um, probably their sensitivity um, to um, maybe you know low ground cover and stuff like that. So that's maybe something to consider that you, you might want to rip in a low ground cover situation and, and then try and establish a legume. But that's probably true um, of all the crops. And I actually see that it could be a benefit of some of these legumes like chickpeas and like lentils or vetch or field peas that um, they can probably um, tolerate being sown at a deeper depth or um, have soil collapse back in the furrow, um, increasing your depth of sowing, which is a real problem in um, cereal crops after deep ripping. So I can see some benefits there. Um, the other thing to think about is, um, you know, what's the, what's the overall likely economic response um, from the crops as well. So, um, you know, something like chickpeas, I'm not sure what its current price is, but you know, a couple of years ago it was worth uh, probably a lot more money than what cereals were at the start of the season. So uh, that benefit may be more economic, economical under um, some of these legume crops than what you can um, get uh, after the cereal crops as well. So um, one thing hopefully that will come out over the next three year period is the systems uh, benefits. Um, because obviously if you can create that much extra growth in the chickpeas that we saw, um, hopefully that's going to be of huge benefit to the crops that follow um, compared to an unripped situation as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots of lots of questions um, that, that um, need answering, but we don't have all the answers at the moment because we're really only one or two years, um, two years into evaluating the practice. Um, yeah, that's a really good answer there, Michael. We've got a few years ahead of us, I think, with some of this um, research. Did anyone have anything in response to Michael's answer they wanted to quickly type in or, or ask? One thing I would say about ripping is being very careful with um, your pre-emergent herbicide application. Um, even probably to the point of considering it with legumes that, um, that you, you almost go without um, because what, one thing that we can see is yeah the extra um, the, the issues at seeding extra depth um, furrow collapse and soil movement um, so I can see that being quite detrimental to, to legumes if um, uh, if that was to occur after after ripping so being very careful of how you apply uh, say herbicides especially uh, in rip situations would be a tip. Yep, excellent. Very good tip there, Michael. And uh, to finish off on, so if anyone's looking for further information on pulses, GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest pulse information.
we have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. If you have any other suggestions or requests, things that you would like to learn about pulses, please let myself know. My best email contact is claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at bcg.org.au. Keep an eye out for future webinars occurring during March. Thank you very much, Michael, for a great presentation. Once you all leave this webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a quick survey link. It has five questions. It should take you no more than a minute just to see how you found today. If you want to fill it out, that will be very much appreciated and will help us to continue to bring you Pulse webinars. If you would like to be kept in the loop of when these webinars occur again, please email myself and I can add you to the distribution list. Thank you very much everyone and thank you Michael.